Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Victoria Hodgetts Morton and I'm an NIHR clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham. I'm here today to talk about the QUID study, an update on the QUID study parts one and two, and sharing threatened preterm birth labour, preterm birth or labour best practice from the UK. So disclosure before I start my slides. This project is funded by the NIHR Health Technist Technology Assessment Board and the views expressed are those of the author and the study team and not necessarily those of the NIHR or the Department of Health and Social Care. The tests used in, in this um, study were provided by, by the co companies owning fetal fibre and actin partitial and actin partis and have received an honorarium from Hologic for today's talk. So this is an infographic from the British Association of Perinatal Medicine which illustrates that antenatal optimization improves the neonatal mortality and morbidity associated with preterm birth and preterm labor. But essentially, we need really good preterm birth prediction to ensure that we have optimal antenatal and peripartum optimization. However, prediction of preterm birth is difficult and we naturally overtreat to ensure that a minority of babies receive the benefits that I've described. In fact, fewer than one in 10 women with signs and symptoms of preterm birth actually deliver. For many women who do not deliver, interventions can carry significant impact, both on mental health, um, pregnancy wellbeing, and significant economic costs. And I'll just give you a moment just to have a look at these two quotes and to think about what, what um, over intervention can, effects can have. And if we move on to think of the levels of overtreatment with regards to steroids, for every five women who have antenatal steroids, an additional five women have an unnecessary treatment or inappropriately timed treatment. And we know that steroids can have negative health benefits for babies as well as positive benefits. So this leads us to think about how we can better predict preterm birth and preterm labour. And prediction tests such as qualitative fetal fibronectin is a diagnostic test for preterm labour and an important part of, of predicting those women that will go on to, to have early deliveries. Now qualitative fetal fibronectin as a cutoff of positive or negative with a 15 nanogram per mil cutoff is actually a reasonably good test. This is a rock curve and the diagonal line across the, the center of the graph is a area under the curve of 0.5, which demonstrates a completely useless test. A very good test, and a, which shows good discrimination, will have a, have a curve right up in the top left-hand corner. And you can see that qualitative fetal fibronectin for, for birth less than seven to 10 days has a rock curve area of 0.84 to 0.8 to 0.87 with a 95% confidence interval. So actually qualitative fetal fibronectin is a reasonable test, but we always should be trying to think about how we can do manage um, prediction better. And that less led to the consideration of using quantitative fetal fibronectin on a scale of 0 to 500 nanograms per mil. And when Dr. Stock looked at using um, quantitative fetal fibronectin in a 2014 review article, she found that there was no standard ways of using the quantitative fetal fibronectin, lots of different women with the test was performed on. There was discussion about which was best qualitative or quantitative and whether it was better to um, treat all or treat a high risk few. What thresholds to use, less than 200, less than 500, less than 50, and actually what management to initiate at what threshold. So what thresholds would be appropriate for steroid or for magnesium sulfate or for in neutro transfer. And as you can see, Thing, things aren't, aren't particularly clear cut. A UK, a UK prospective cohort study of 279 women had 16 women who delivered less than 14 days. And that did demonstrate that as, as the levels of quantitative fetal fibronectin rise, then the positive predictive value also increases. But the 2018 NICE diagnostic guidance at that point suggested that there was no evidence to recommend the routine adoption of quantitative fetal fibronectin above 
the 50 nanograms per milliliter cutoff of positive or negative um, fetofibrin to help diagnose preterm labor. And so this led to the development of the QUIDS project, which was an NIHR commission call, which was an aim to develop a validated prognostic model to predict spontaneous preterm birth within seven days of testing women with signs and symptoms of preterm birth. It was a personalized risk-based assessment on multiple features. So the idea was that we would develop a model from assist, existing data sets that had fetal fibronectin in with clinical risk predictors. We would use an internal validation process and then we would externally validate this model with a recruitment of a prospective observation, observational cohort. And then we would evaluate how this model could be implemented into practice. And if you would like more information of, this, of the development of this project, then both the protocols are published in BMJ Open. This is an infographic that shows you the overview of the QUIDS project. And so we identified five studies that were, eight, were suitable to, to go into the model development and who agreed to share their data to allow an ind uh, individualized patient data meta-analysis and um, prognostic modeling was use with an internal validation process to, um, to develop the model that we are talking about. Following the prognostic, following the internal validation, the prospective cohort study was recruited across 26 hospitals within the UK. Um, and I'll go on to talk about that in, in a short while. And then there was external validation of this model using the prospective observational cohort, and then the implementation of this risk prediction model in women between 22 and 34 plus six weeks who present with signs and symptoms of preterm labor. This is an overview of the included studies. And so we used um, five studies across uh, who had data sets across Europe who had agreed to data sharing for the IPD meta-analysis. The model was developed using 1,783 women with a spontaneous preterm birth rate of 7.8% within seven days. The candidate predictors for the clinical model were age, BMI, ethnicity, smoking, nulliparity, previous preterm birth, cervical treatment, quantitative fetal fibronectin, cervical length, number of contractions, vaginal bleeding, cervical dilatation, and multiple pregnancy and gestational age. And you can see that these candidate predictors are the predictors that you would expect to be interested in when you're considering predicting preterm birth in women. So we use a log logistic regression stepwise selection to develop um, the model. Now, in fact, we actually developed several models using quin clinical protectors and um, quantitative fetal fibronectin here, clinical predictors and quantitative fetal fibronectin plus cervical length here, which included three studies where there was complete data sets or clinical predictors and quantitative fetal fibronectin and cervical length using multiple imputation to where there was missing data. For the, for the project, we selected this model where we um, had um, clinical predictors and quantitative fetal fibronectin without cervical length because as you're aware in UK obstetric practice um, the availability of cervical length scanning in the maternity assessment areas where women will present with signs and symptoms of preterm labour is limited. We also used a variable selection model so that all um, so that the variables that were inputted into the into the algorithm were limited and therefore we felt that that would improve data entry. The model development identified the following five important factors, so the quantitative fetal fibronectin, smoking, ethnicity, nulliparity and pregnancy. Once the model was developed, we um, tested this model in the QUID's prospective cohort study across 26 centres within the UK. The inclusion for the criteria for the prospective cohort study was um, women between 22 weeks to 34 plus six weeks of pregnancy who had signs and symptoms of preterm labour were admitted to hospital um, or were considering into hospital transfer or treatment was being considered age 16 years or above with cervical dilatation less than or equal to three centimetres with intact membranes and no significant vaginal bleeding. 
The prospective model recruited 2,968 women with a complete data set of 2,924 2, women with a very small number of women who have had an incomplete fetal fibronectin test or an in invalid result. This model, th this um, prospective cohort was then um, externally validated in the clinical prediction quantitative model that we developed. And you can see from the previous slide, the area under the curve is 0.89 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.87 to 0.93, which is very similar to the, to the um, developed model that we had and showed good discrimination and good ca calibration. And therefore, in conclusion, the QUID project demonstrated that we could have a validated model for a prediction of spontaneous preterm birth within seven days using quantitative fetal fibronectin. It had good performance. It was likely to have clinical benefit, not detailed here, but um, within the whole project, it was cost effective and it was acceptable to, to women in clinicians. And therefore the next stages of this project are to implement this model within practice and um, development of an app calculator, which I'll talk about um, in, towards the end of the talk. During the development of of the QUID's prognostic model, it became apparent that we would it would be beneficial to consider the other predictive tests for preterm labour, so acting partus and partisure, and therefore that we had an additional, um, and at that point there was guideline, guidelines from the NICE diagnostic guidance um, body that there was currently insufficient evidence to recommend the routine adoption of partisure or acting partus to help pre-diagnose preterm labour, and we evaluated whether there would be any additional value of these of these predictive tests within our model. <clears throat> so the quiz two aims were to provide a preliminary comparison of the independent prognostic value of actin partus, partisure, and quantitative fetal fibronectin in women with signs and symptoms of preterm labor. And the in and more specifically it was to evaluate the test accuracy accuracy of each of the three tests so actin partus, partisure, qualitative fetal fibronectin as a positive or negative value. Uh, which was the um, standard test at that point in time, used in isolation to predict preterm birth, and then to compare the prognostic value of actin partus, partisure, compared to quantitative fetal fibronectin when adjusted for clinical risk factors. This was a prospective cohort study in 19 centres. The clinicians were blinded to quantitative fetal fibronectin, partisure, and the actin partus result. We had 12 events of spontaneous preterm birth and it was an exploratory analysis to compare the diagnostic test accuracy of two by two tables, the test sensitivity, specificity, positive likelihood ratio and negative likelihood ratio. The QUIDS2 method, prognostic value. So the QUIDS2 cohort was a smaller part of the QUID study that I've mentioned and discussed earlier in this talk. And what we did is we, we developed a prognostic model based on clinical risk factors that was collapsed to a single predictor variable. And then we use that in collaboration with the QUIDS2 cohort to, um, in combination with a quantitative fetal fibronectin or an actin partus test or a partisure test. And you can see that the individual um, diagnostic test, qualitative fetal fibronectin had the highest sensitivity and specificity and positive likelihood ratio and negative um, likelihood, likelihood ratio compared to actin partus and partisure. And when used in combination with the clinical risk model, um, quantitative fetal fibronectin provided significant benefits compared to actin partus in the, used in the model or partisure used in the model. So our conclusions from this study was that there was no signal that actin partus or partisure are superior to qualitative fetal fibronectin for diagnostic accuracy. And there was no signal that the use of actin partus or partisure would improve the prognostic potential of our prognostic model. At present, our evidence suggests that the QUIDS model with quantitative fetal fibronectin is the most robust model for prediction of spontaneous preterm birth within seven days for the UK population. And the take home messages from today are that this is an externally validated model for the prediction of spontaneous preterm birth within seven days using quantitative fetal fibronectin. It has good performance with a, with a good area under the curve. It's likely to have clinical benefit. 
It's cost effective, it's acceptable to women and clinicians. But we also have to be mindful that preterm birth in women with symptoms of preterm labour is rare, with, with lower than anticipated incidence within a, in a um, prospective observation, observational cohort. And that when we are doing, um, doing projects like this, we do need robust methodology for prognostic research. The next steps are, are the app development. And so a quality improvement project is currently underway at the University of Edinburgh, where the QUID's um, prognostic model is being developed into an app that can be used within the clinical setting. And this is a screenshot of the demo model, which at the moment is having good reviews for acceptability and usability. Interestingly, although the previous history of preterm birth wasn't considered to be a um, <clears throat> important contributor to the predictability of the model, clinicians felt very uncomfortable without that being in the um, application. And so at the moment that's being added as a non-calculated um, recording. And we are also um, looking at implementing this, this um, prognostic model within the Baginet and other maternity um, me medical record keeping. And so that's the end of my talk now. And, I've, and I'd just like to say that I would like to thank Sarah Stock, who was the CI for this project, for inviting me to be involved. And you can see that this project has required a, a significant team across the whole of the UK. And I'd like to thank all members for um, what was an exciting and interesting product, project. Thank you.